gifts of our, our students. We build that on evidence. We make decisions. We set priorities based on what the evidence shows. And we complete this cycle. We bring it around to a point where we analyze the results and we ask the question again, what should our, result, what should our goals be? What should our priorities be? Making this not a once and done type program where we're going to work through it and then be done, but to make it truly a part of our institutional culture. Further evidence that working with achieving the dream is a good fit for our institution is seen when you look at the definition of student success set out by uh, the Achieving the Dream movement. As you look across these five things, you'll see some very common, very familiar uh, success metrics. Uh, completion of learning support and gateway math and English courses. Uh, completing courses with a C or better. Persistence from fall to spring, fall to fall. Uh, achieving credit milestones and achieving that, that final uh, degree, that credential. Those are things that are very familiar to us. And we find those things embedded in our activities and things that we're already doing. And so achieving the dream doesn't take us off in a new direction. It's not going to be out of sync with who we are. Achieving the dream is really, truly a partner with who we are and taking us down the same pathway. In order to do this, those two coaches, those two dedicated coaches, are going to help our institution improve our capability and our capacity in these seven essential areas. To help us become better with our leadership and in our vision. Uh, improve our ability of gathering and analyzing data. Building equity. Our teaching and learning aspects. Uh, in, uh, engagement, communication, the strategy, the policies. Helping us become better at what we do. We really are excited about this movement. Heather talked about how when we got the call and we, we kind of jumped on that opportunity uh, to do this because we understand that every day through all the things and all the activities that we do on our campus, what we're really doing at the end of the day, we're changing people's lives. And that's a very, very important thing to do. And so I want to leave you with this quote because I think what it does is it best summarizes the what we do and the why we do it. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Bill Law, who is the president of St. Petersburg College in Florida. Access changes self-perception. Degrees and uh, certificates change lives. What do we do? We grant access to students. We open the door to higher education for, our, for the students, uh, the, the citizens of Tennessee often giving them opportunities that they may not otherwise have. What do we do? We award credentials, d diplomas, certificates, degrees. That's the what. The why do we do that? The heart of it, what we really need to focus on, we change people's lives by doing this. And that's important. And so with the help of achieving the dream, Jackson State is going to be better situated and better able to do just that. Thank you.
skills real quick. If I take my coat off, can I leave it on? Did everybody get everybody get a got a mouth? Well, it just kind of cheapens it for me. Comfortable. I might take a nap here. <laughs> you come bump me if I am. Hey, you put that in file 13 too. Thank you. I'm good. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. I got too much stuff, stuff, stuff. <laughs> too much stuff. Daryl and Russ, both of Sanja. Oh. Daryl and Russ were both still out in the lobby. Okay, that'd be great. Jackson was here, but might have stepped on out.
There's Daryl. There's Russ. Okay. Oh, there's Lee. Good. I haven't even seen her yet this morning. Sanja over there. I don't know where she is. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the quarterly meeting of the Tennessee Board of Regents. Dr. Blanding, thanks to you and your team for that incredible presentation just now on achieving the dream, which is what it's all about ultimately for us at the Board of Regents between our universities, our community colleges, and our Tennessee Colleges of Applied Technology. And hopefully, Unlike that picture of the canoe on television, all of us are in the water with the oars all going the same way um, in this very historic and interesting time for public higher education in Tennessee. Um, again, our thanks to Dr. Blanding and the team for what's been a remarkable visit um, here at Jackson State. I do want to remind all of us, and we need to have a productive dialogue this morning, but as accommodating as Jackson State has been, I've been told that they need us out of this room at 12 noon. So we must work <laughs> diligently and concentrate here over the next uh, two and a half hours or so. Uh, last night we had an incredible evening at Snyder Farms here in the Jackson area. Um, what a remarkable facility. It was a great evening, great camaraderie. We were delighted to have uh, the county mayor, uh, Jimmy Harris, join us, Representative Johnny Shaw, um, and State Senator Ed Jackson, who was also here with us for this morning's presentation. So our thanks to them for, on what are already very busy schedules for taking the time to be with us. And yesterday to our student and faculty representatives who attended um, and, and spoke up on several issues. They were a delight. A couple of them were able to join us last night. But they remind us for here at Jackson State, for the TCAT here at Jackson, at the end of the day, what this is all about. And it is achieving the dream. It is student success. So we are very grateful for their attendance. So without further ado, Madam Secretary, would you call the roll? Yes. Uh, Regent Deaton, Here. Regent Duckett, Here. Regent Farwell, Here. Regent Freeman, Here. Regent Griscom, Here. Regent Johnson, Here. Regent Markham, Here. Regent Prescott, Here. Regent Reynolds, Here. Regent Roddy, Here. Regent Russell, Here. Regent Shockey, Here. Regent Smith, Here. Regent Thomas, Here. Regent Varlin. Here. You have a quorum, Madam. Thank you very Chairman. much. Uh, our first item uh, this morning is the approval of our board meeting from June 19, the approval of those minutes. I believe everyone's had the minutes and had a chance to review them. Um, I will call for a motion to accept those minutes as presented. So moved. So moved by Regent Thomas, second from Regent Roddy. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, this is a simple voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Our minutes from June are approved. Thank you very much. Chancellor Morgan, your report of interim action. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the report before you constitutes a record of the business transacted by the Office of Chancellor since the previous regular meeting, quarterly meeting of the board. I think that has been shared with you. I would note, Madam Chair uh, and members, that uh, we did uh, forward to you on August 25th a letter regarding the HVAC uh, program at Pell City State Community College at Strawberry Plain uh, Campus. It was incorrectly uh, stated it was a, the TCAT Knoxville uh, program at, at the Strawberry Plains campus was incorrectly stated as being 728 hours. It should have been 2,160 hours. I think we talked about that yesterday. Uh, so with that correction uh, recorded in the minutes of the board and pending any questions, I would recommend your approval of the report of interim action. Any questions for the chancellor? We need a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you, Regent Thomas. Second. Second. Thank you. Hearing none, this too is a voice vote. All in favor of approving the report of interim action? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you very much. We're moving right along. Uh, yesterday, obviously, was a busy day with our committee work. Um, that those committee reports have been. 
in on our TBR app. Each respective committee chair received those last night when we returned to the hotel. Uh, since this is on our con consent agenda, we will dispense with reading those reports. Um, as you see, you have before you the minutes of our Workforce Development Committee, Academic Policies and Programs, and the minutes of the Audit Committee from August. Um, is there any discussion, or may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Thank you, Regent Griskin. A second? Second. Second, Regent Parker. Re Regent Parker. Regent Smith. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> to discuss the Regents Award and Excellence in Philanthropy. Thank you. Thank you. Today, the Tennessee Board of Regents is proud to recognize Mr. George Johnson and Ms. Betty Johnson as recipients of the 2015 Regents Award for Excellence in Philanthropy, nominated by the University of Memphis. On May 14th, George and Betty Johnson were awarded the prestigious 2015 Regents Award for Excellence in Philanthropy. George, a 1970 alumnus, and his wife Betty, a 1975 alumnus of the University of Memphis, epitomized the spirit of the Regents Award through their innovative philanthropic effort, cons consistent financial support, and generous time commitment. They ensure continued success of their alma mater with contributions of more than $1.7 million to, dollars to various academic and athletic programs. George, president of BJB, an asset management and accounting firm, continually utilizes his community relationships on behalf of the university. He is a key donor to the Fogelman College of Business and Economics which included a strategic investment to reward top-level faculty and, and offer incentives for staff to excel in their positions. In creating the program, George stated, I want to do what I can to build up the business school and challenge other businesses to do the same. The Johnsons generously extend beyond the business college to the field of K-12 education, where they endowed a graduate scholarship for students pursuing a degree in the College of Education, Health, and Human Sciences. As a retired teacher, it was Betty's desire to support teachers pursuing a graduate degree. They also contribute to the student ath athletes at the university through scholarships and capital improvements for baseball and basketball. George is an active member of the campus community and has served on a number of high-profile searches and committees, including the steering committee for the university's Empowering the Dream Centennial Campaign, and as a member of the Board of Visitors and the University of Memphis Foundation Board of Trustees. Most recently, the Johnsons initiated and funded a senior luncheon that is intended to encourage students in their final year of classes to remain involved and engaged in the university after graduation. While their generosity sets an example for fellow alumni and friends, the Johnsons also share their convictions about supporting a wide range of causes and organizations, including the Lemoyne Owens College, Soulsville Charter School, St. Mary's Episcopal School, Urban Youth Initiative, Hope House, Furry Friends, No Kill Home, Ducks Unlimited, Baptist Memorial Healthcare Foundation, Bridges, and Metropolitan Interfaith Association. I'm pleased today to acknowledge the Regents Award for Excellence in Philanthropy to George and Betty Johnson for their continued and loyal support to the Tennessee Board of Regents, University of Memphis, and higher education in Tennessee. For additional comments, I would like to ask the University of Memphis President, David Rudd, to step forward to the podium.
Good morning. Good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to add a couple additional comments. I would say that uh, that covered it very nicely. George has had remarkable, uh, George and Betty have had remarkable impact on the University of Memphis, the, the local community, uh, for many, many years. We are proud to have them a part of the University of Memphis family. We appreciate the opportunity to recognize and acknowledge uh, those commitments, uh, the wonderful and enduring impact that they've had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Rudd. Vice Chair Reynolds, that concludes my report. There may be other regents who might want to speak to. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. And thank you, President Rudd. We're glad you're here today. Good to see you. Thank you. I think Regent Duckett does have a comment. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to provide additional comments. And obviously, we've heard about the monetary uh, involvement that uh, George has had as it relates to a number of endeavors there in the uh, Memphis uh, community, but one of the things I would like for those of you in the audience to know about George is that uh, we asked George to serve on the Presidential Search Committee uh, for the University of Memphis, and following the first uh, orientation meeting that we had, uh, I had the pleasure of serving as the chair of that committee, I get a one-and-a-half-page email from George outlining his thoughts on how the process could be improved. The purpose of my bringing that up is this is a man who not only puts his money behind causes that he believes is important to him, but he also puts his time and effort into anything that he's involved in. So I gained a higher degree of respect working with George on the uh, search committee, and I felt it important that those of you here at least knew his commitment, uh, that his commitment goes beyond just a monetary gift to those activities that he thinks are important to him. Well said. Regents Prescott or Shockey, any comments? Can't really add a thing to that. Okay. Well, very well deserved award. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Regent Markham. Thank you. And again, it's always fun to salute these great folks who care about our institutions and, as Regent Duckett said so well, invest not simply their, their money, which is always important and put to good use, but their time and their care as well. So thank you. Well done. And thank you to, to George and Betty Johnson, two very special Tennesseans. And I have now lost my place. <coughs> There we go. Report of the Chancellor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and in recognition of our need to, to be brief, I will actually be brief for a change. Um, but I would, as I usually do, uh, turn over my report to someone else, and I would invite uh, Wendy Thompson, our Vice Chancellor for Organizational Effectiveness and Strategic Initiatives, or something like that, to, uh, to give us a a report, and then I will have a couple of things to add after that. <clears throat> Good morning, Madam Vice Chair, Regents, Chancellor, colleagues. Each September, we give you an update on where we are towards our goal for our completion agenda. And as a quick recap for those who are new to the body, um, each segment of Tennessee higher education was given a numerical goal for the drive to 55. And we took our goal and expanded upon it to develop a broader completion agenda goal. Um, and we report each September on our progress towards that goal. After hearing the presentation yesterday and the presentation this morning, I know that you know we are all in on this. We are all about student success, which in turn means we're all about increasing the number of Tennesseans with post-secondary credentials. But what the CDU does to make sure we are focused on our outcomes is we ask ourselves a series of questions. And the first one is, what are we trying to do? And again, our contribution to the state's goal of credential production in 2025 is to award 43,202 credentials. There we go. That's just the title slide. I'm catching up. Okay. Um, so 
again, we are all about student success, but we want to keep a focus on outcomes. So we ask ourselves, what is our goal? And of course, our goal is 43,202 credentials in 2025. And then we ask, how are we trying to do it? You hear at each board meeting um, an update on one of our 10 priority strategies, and we usually will give you um, an update on a particular one at the September board meeting, but in the interest of time, and also recognizing everything you've heard yesterday, we're not gonna do that. Um, you heard yesterday in the panel uh, key initiatives that we have that are focused on helping students progress towards their credential, and then being able to seamlessly get another credential if that's what they so desire. We've got lots of initiatives like that throughout the system, in addition to our 10 key priority strategies, and we try and keep a focus on our progress in those initiatives that help us toward achieving our goal of 43,202. The third question we ask is, how will we know if we're on track towards reaching our goal? So we constantly monitor our own progress on key initiatives. We do stock takes, as we've explained before. We assist campuses with implementation of their key initiatives. And we constantly monitor student progress. You heard a lot of information yesterday about data. We look at leading indicators. You heard today about specific indicators that Achieving the Dream looks at. Um, it, for instance, what are the progression rates? How are students progressing? What are the retention rates? How many students are in the graduation pipeline? For instance, having senior status. Um, Regent Freeman, that answers the, the opportunity question. How many seniors are in the pipeline? Um, so I'm pleased to say that as a result of all of those initiatives, we are on track towards reaching our completion goal. In 2025, we awarded 34,033 credentials, which was above our target for 2015. And while we can and should celebrate that success, we have already started looking at how we can increase these numbers. And some factors that we're looking at going forward are the fact that we now have evidence of the potential impact of Tennessee Promise and Tennessee Reconnect in our schools. We're almost at full implementation on a number of our key system initiatives, and we're looking at ways to strengthen our capabilities to track students once they graduate from our institutions, to track them in the workforce, to track them if they're continuing their education. So in short, we're pleased that we have reached and exceeded our 2015 goal, but we're also looking forward to being able to do better. Any questions? get this thing to turn on. Um, what you just said that you're looking for ways to track students as they may move forward as to whether they go on with further education. Um, what about beyond that, you know, in terms of not just education, but job, you know, getting a job. Can you talk about? Be able to track them to where they go. Some go okay. to the workplace. Um, we can track those students to a certain degree. We're trying to do better. We've got an initiative. Um, that we're working on with the state to be able to track them better, yeah, yes. And, um, but what doesn't show up is the ones that are back in, in school to get another degree. So we wanna know where all our students go. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for, for Wendy? I think it was an important slide. Commissioner Johnson. That was an important slide. I sure would hope that uh, that could be shared with us. I'd like to use that in some of my presentations. Sure. Okay, absolutely. Great idea. Other thoughts? Thank okay. You. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That was a quick one today. Well done. Yeah. Keep up the good work, gang. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. When you get good news, what else is there to say, right? Just keep going. Do I, Chancellor, do I, I think have to you, talk our way out of that. Exactly. You, I think you have some additional <laughs> updates and comments. Yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, a few things for you. Uh, some uh, meetings in the past, but also just some, some meetings in the future. Um, the, the vice chair and I did have a, an opportunity some weeks ago to go to Standing Stone State Park, which was my very first time of going to Standing Stone State Park. 
And as I've said before, I, I have yet to see the standing stone. I don't really understand exactly what, <clears throat> what is that, there one what the, Did we miss is, is there a standing stone there? Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. <laughs> At any rate, we had the opportunity to meet with uh, a, a room full of extraordinarily bright students uh, from across our colleges and universities, the uh, Student Government Association leadership. Um, and it was, uh, it was a very, uh, 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 enthusiastic group it was I came away with extraordinary optimism but it was also pretty humbling to be in front of uh, a group of students who could ask very penetrating questions and uh, weren't satisfied with stock answers I guess would be a, a way to say it but we talked about several issues uh, a little bit about ourselves and kind of how we ended up where we are both uh, Emily and I were able to do that but really had a good conversation about the challenges that our students are facing, the things that we really should be focused on as a system uh, and as institutions. Had a pretty robust conversation about textbooks, uh, and I think it will prompt, has already prompted, and will prompt uh, further uh, conversation about how we deal with the issue of, of materials and getting those materials in the hands of students in the most efficient uh, an inexpensive way that we possibly can. Uh, but it was a great experience, and it suggests to me that we have, uh, we need to, to continue to enhance our, our efforts to, to get uh, input uh, from students, uh, from our primary customers, although some folks don't like that term, but in some ways they're our customers. Uh, and uh, Nick, I would, would suggest that uh, we're really looking for you to help us uh, really understand how better to get student input into to the conversations we have here, the decisions uh, that we make. So that was a, a great experience uh, for us and, and one that I, I hope is repeated and, and would like to rec recognize, I don't think she's here, but Heidi Lemon, uh, who is a Vice Chancellor for Student uh, Affairs, uh, Assistant Vice Chancellor or, or Associate Vice Chancellor, works with Tristan. Um, <clears throat> Uh, really uh, has done a, a very good job of organizing the, uh, those uh, kind of activities and I think will, will really help us at a system uh, system office level uh, focus much more on, on how we can help students uh, be successful in very real ways. Uh, some meetings coming up uh, and Ginger you may have to help me with the dates here but I think there are two uh, subcommittees of the, of the Senate Education Committee. One focuses on K-12 and I believe they have a meeting October 5th and 6th, maybe, or October, that, that uh, is scheduled. Now, it's, it's mostly, as I understand it, about the quality issues around K-12. I think they'll talk about, uh, and certainly we'll talk about standards in, in some fashion. Uh, but we have also been invited to participate in that. So we'll have folks from our system uh, testifying on a panel or in some fashion, really about our perceptions of quality and kind of our input. Uh, and that's uh, you know, and that is an issue that cuts two ways. One is, of course, we we always want higher quality students coming to our institutions, um, but we also have a pretty large responsibility in uh, how those students uh, do because we train most of the teachers uh, in our public school system. Uh, so, kind of from both directions, we have, uh, I think, a place at the table to talk about quality. That will happen, uh, and then a week or so later, October 14th and 15th. Uh, there will be a, the Senate uh, Education Subcommittee on Higher Education uh, has called a hearing. Uh, we'll know more about that agenda in, in the coming days, and as we do, we'll, we will uh, make, make you aware of kind of how that is shaping out. But two of the things that we know are, are topics. One is uh, this issue that you may have noticed in the paper in the last few weeks about uh, gender neutral pronouns uh, and that that conversation that uh, has, has been going on uh, so that's part of what that committee uh, meeting will deal with but also issues of governance and we're not quite sure what that means Russ I don't know whether you have a, a, a in, any insight into that or not but uh, uh, but we'll learn as I say we'll learn more about that as we as we move toward that that meeting and, and we'll keep you apprised of that and then the last thing I'll mention is a, a summit that will be on Monday. Uh, the governor has called a higher ed summit. I think it's an opportunity to, to both celebrate uh, some of the great things that have happened here over the last few weeks in terms of uh, Tennessee Promise, but also to, to really bring a focus on, uh, well, now what do we do? Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've made 
made great strides in terms of access. It's kind of the conversation, Bruce, that, that we had earlier. Uh, but what about success? How, how, how is it that we're going to respond to make sure that students have the best opportunity to succeed? Uh, and also, I think incorporating uh, universities uh, more into the conversation around Drive to 55 uh, and, uh, and the, the governor's uh, higher ed uh, agenda and initiatives going forward. So I look forward to, I, I will not be at that meeting, but we'll have good representation. I think all regions probably have been notified uh, and invited to that. If you hadn't, you're supposed to have been. So uh, Monday, 9.30 at the Music City Center in Nashville, it's about a three hour, uh, I think a three hour meeting is what's planned. Uh, so we look forward to that. I think this, you know, the one thing that uh, we have said before and we'll probably say again is, you know, and, and Russ, I know you have the same, the same experience. When anywhere we go, when we go outside the state of Tennessee, um, people are talking about Tennessee. They want to know what we're doing. What are you doing now? You know, how's it working? Uh, and we really are at a central, kind of central focal point uh, in higher education reform uh, across the country. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, a, it, it's fun to be on the uh, kind of out there, um, but it also brings with it some, some pretty heavy responsibility to be successful. Uh, I think I've said before, we're on the, the leading edge of expectation uh, and uh, trying to deliver on that promise uh, and deliver on that dream is, is something that we're all about. And I think uh, we have a governor who is absolutely committed to that purpose. So, Madam Chair, that's my, well my report. Thank you very much. Lots going on. That's good. Um, oh, Dr. I did D forget oh. one thing. Yes, yeah. do you me, Excuse me. I, I apologize. I was going to note that yesterday oh, you don't have to do that. I'm going to <laughs> <laughs> yesterday our vice chair Emily Reynolds was inducted into the boardwalk of fame by Nashville Cable Nashville Cable is a leadership organization for women's professional advancement in Tennessee's largest and most established network of diverse professionals committed to connecting women and opportunity Cable's hallmark initiative is women on corporate boards and the boardwalk of fame honors our state's women and companies who are taking the lead in promoting women and advocating for gender diversity in top leadership positions. It recognizes those who demonstrate to the business community in Tennessee and beyond the availability of qualified women and the value that women bring to corporate and public boards. And her service to the Tennessee Board of Regents, I would submit to you, proves that she's more than deserving of this recognition. So congratulations, Vice Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I was hoping you had forgotten. <laughs> so, but that's very nice of you all. So it was a great honor and a great morning. So it meant, unfortunately, I didn't get here until lunchtime. Um, but it was a great start to the day. So thank you very much. Um, as we move along, oh, I was going to direct a question first to Dr. Deaton. Um, and since the Chancellor engaged you in the conversation, give us kind of your view now that we know fall enrollment numbers tell us where you think we are on the promise and what we might look forward to here over this first semester great question and first congratulations to vice chair reynolds on that honor um, it's i think there's been a bit of a fulfillment of a lot of the expectations that the state had about how promise and reconnect would roll out and in large part it's due to the folks in this room who've made it possible you know there's always been two dynamics we're watching very closely is to what extent do these programs attract new students to higher education and then also then how does that change students and their behavior uh, not only initially accessing college but then transfer activity and hopefully propensity to graduate and I think it's uh, we're off to an ex excellent start and I think um, um, not only and this is one of the beauties of one of the things we talk about when we go out of state that Chan Chancellor alluded to is that these programs that exist in Tennessee are not operating in isolation so as these students come on a campus they are encountering a lot of the creativity and innovation that has been going on and the seeds of which have been planted many years ago. And because of that, because of the connections of Promise and Reconnect and the programs that campuses have now, I think we're going to uh, be extremely well satisfied of how this rolls out, not only as we evaluate it in the next subsequent semesters, but on down the road uh, in, in future years. Um, to say nothing, too, 
of the general excitement and the sort of public psychology that has changed about the way, I mean, I hear this from my family um, and, and, and in the schools where, that my kids attend. Uh, I mean, that's, that's unusual and that is to be celebrated and is to be, uh, it's a good foundation to build upon. Is your, is your, was it your five-year-old who was asking you every morning how we were doing on the Tennessee Promise? Yeah, he, my, my first grader now, he, uh, he, he I, I don't know if, I, may I tell the story? This Please. is kind of fun. So uh, one day at uh, breakfast, um, my middle son, Gr Grady is his name, uh, he saw my Drive to 55 coffee mug and he asked me what that was and I, I told him that that's about some of the efforts underway at my work and 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 he then asked well where are you right now and I told him that we're about you know 32 percent education tame and then I made him do the math to make sure he could kind of figure out where to go next which he finds is a challenge it's, it's kind of fun uh, and then he said so so where are you, what are you going to be at today daddy if you want to get to 55 where are you today and I said well it doesn't really work that way because you know we measure this in terms of months and years and it's really long term uh, and, and he, and he kind of he kind of moved on, and then I thought about it, and, and kind of thought, we well, you know, he's asking exactly the right question, which is, what do we do every day to wake up to make progress towards that goal? Um, and and so he he actually periodically will return to this topic and ask me, where where are you in the drive to 55? He's now aware of it as an issue. So it's it's actually saturating even our elementary schools across the That's state. Great. So this is a great show. go Grady. You need to take that slide home <laughs> that Commissioner Johnson was asking for. Absolutely, yes. Regent Griscom. I want to direct this to Chancellor. I assume, Chancellor, based on your report, that part of what you're looking at as a system is really best practices, you know, seeing how uh, some of our community colleges really put things together, those that really hit maybe a higher mark than others, realizing that everybody sort of sure. has come up. Uh, but. Uh, what did some of us do to maybe have a better connection with the mentoring part with with the people who applied to keep them there but then to the four-year side because i think it's great to talk about you know tennessee promise uh, and and reconnect but then on the four-year side what are we learning there you know are we really focused on how do we now do more to re reach out and capture those transfer students that are coming through and are we designed and looking at going back in now with the promise kids or students pardon me and saying let's start identifying them now in our community colleges and getting them prepared to go on into our four-year school so I'm sure you're doing this but I just want yes. to put that on the record because I think Absolutely. there's a lot for us to learn as a system from what we've done this uh, this you know past uh, we, summer yes and, and 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 yes to all the above all those things are happening across our system uh, and I think <clears throat> as I mentioned part of the part of I believe the point of the summit next week is to to really help help us all understand the role that the universities play not only uh, in educating uh, students and, and taking those transfers and taking the, the classes that they come have entering uh, their schools but also in growing the economy you know, <clears throat> you know a lot of what we talk about is workforce preparation workforce development um, creating the workforce that can fill the jobs that are there what the universities do in a very real way is help create those jobs. They help actually drive the economic development engine that creates the environment within which businesses are created, businesses expand. So it's everybody in our system has a key role to play uh, in really meeting the state's, uh, the state's goals and the state's development success. Um, there's a lot of activity going on on each of our campuses. Uh, some, as we report to you frequently, about system level activities. Um, all d driven towards student success. That's both at the colleges as well as the universities as well as the TCATs. Uh, and I think each of our universities have uh, undertaken some, some very serious activities about how they can reach out and connect today with those promised students that are in the colleges uh, and, uh, and begin to build through dual admission, through uh, inviting folks onto their campuses and, and a whole range of activities to try to capitalize on those students who are interested in transfer uh, so that at the time they're ready to come to a four-year school they already have a relationship built with those students and that will lead to higher success rates for those students that do transfer so yes yeah, so that's that's very much on the minds of and the sharing of best practices is something that we uh, we do every day I mean we focus on that at the system office every day uh, is how to identify those things that really do seem to be working extraordinarily well and and transfer that that information across the system Regent Barlin, did you have something okay 
Any other comments or questions? Well done. Well, everything, your question and Russ's words about creativity and innovation are a perfect segue to our reports from our presidents and directors. And I believe Dr. Elisa White from Austin P. State University is reporting today for our four-year universities. We had the chance to be on her campus, what, the 1st of September, I guess? Groundbreaking for our new fine arts building. Very exciting. Thank you. It was a great morning. Thank you for this opportunity and congratulations yesterday. I don't want to follow kid stories again. Oh, that's, always, that's always hard. <laughs> I'm here today representing Dr. Glover, Dr. McPhee, Dr. Nolan, Dr. Oldham, and Dr. Rudd, and I appreciate the opportunity. You know, we're here to talk about the importance of research on a university campus, and the uh, importance cannot really be overstated. We have at our foundation the obligation for discovery, and so we have faculty who work in labs who are creating ideas that are tested in their labs and create knowledge. That knowledge is very often leading to patents that can be commercialized and that can inform uh, not only success for the economy, but in various industries. And something that's very important to Tennessee, very often those patents are in healthcare. We educate and train graduate students so that they can be good scholars and researchers. And we educate undergraduate students so that they understand how to read uh, scientific reports and that they understand inquiry. We also use research to inform classroom teaching. So rather than just bring students what they learn from others, we actually have teachers who bring their research to the classroom so that the students get the very latest in their disciplines. One of East Tennessee State University's highlights is their prescription drug use, drug abuse and misuse working group, which is composed of public health, pharmacy and medicine faculty and community members. That group has grown to more than 100 people, and they have won $2.2 million from the National Institutes of Health to study substance abuse, to execute three prescription drug abuse prevention-oriented research projects. They've also won $52,000 in a state-funded uh, uh, competitive environment for neonatal abstinence syndrome studies and a $40,000 project funded by you, actually, on prescription stimulant misuse among college students, community college students. The University of Memphis is known for its bioscience research, and they're developing new biomedical implants and devices, as well as new materials and thin coatings that can aid in medical diagnostics and delivery of medical therapies. Their faculty have developed, patent, patented, and licensed a biodegradable sponge that can be used to prevent infection in wounds commonly found in the battlefield and other trauma situations. Next on their horizon is a major initiative in additive manufacturing, or we call it 3D printing, to improve the quality and customizability of biomedical devices. They have an Institute for Intelligent Systems, and that learning technologies team designed, developed, and tested more uh, than two dozen intelligent tutoring systems that have a wide variety of applications. On the cybersecurity front, U of M is the only institution in Tennessee designated by the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security National Center for Excellence for Information Assurance Education and for Information Assurance Cyber Defense Research. In mobile health, they have a National Center of Excellence under the National Institutes of Health Big Data to Knowledge, uh, Knowledge Initiative, and they led a team of 12 universities uh, in that particular effort, and that is a nearly $11 million center. Tennessee Tech is known for innovation, and they have uh, initiated a, a project called iCube. It stands for Imagine, Inspire, and Innovate, and I have seen that, and it's a really an amazing facility. It's immersive visualization and virtual reality environment. And the coolest thing about that project, it is truly collaborative and interdisciplinary. So it is not housed or owned by one academic discipline, but it is where people, the students and faculty from education, training, science and engineering, um, history, art and design, marketing, they participate in simulations to solve problems for the future. And in just eight months, more than 50 students from engineering, business, nursing, environmental science, arts and humanities, history and science have used the iCube. They're also known for healthcare informatics. The Center for Healthcare Informatics uh, develops and provides informatics and statistical tools and software for analytics associated with the complexities of healthcare, and they are complex. 
They're involving um, data associated with physician and hospital treatments, sociological, geological, and economics data. Middle Tennessee State University has the Center for Botanical Medicine Research, and I was uh, privileged to get a tour of that that Dr. McPhee gave me, and it was really pretty amazing. They're developing new drugs or over-the-counter nutraceuticals from botanicals, and they have partner uh, agreements with two key institutions in China that provides those pure compounds or plant extracts, and they're looking at developing new drugs to treat things like anti-cancer, antifungal, anti-trip anosomal and immune modulator drug candidates. Really impressive. They have a forensic science institute called FIRE, directed by an internationally recognized forensic anthropologist. And they hosted conferences on cybersecurity, gangs, and they developed best practices training for law enforcement officials. Their Tennessee uh, Health and Wellbeing Research is looking at underwater treadmill rehabilitation therapy. Pretty exciting. It's a, it is supported by NIH, but they are actually restoring motor function in patients who were considered permanently paralyzed. So that is a huge, huge advancement. In their Advanced Manufacturing and Workforce Development Initiative, their veteran inventor, Charles Perry, is commercializing technology that could significantly change the carbon footprint of medium to heavy duty trucks. At Austin P, we do applied research as well as pure research. And our mobile technology center successfully developed smartphone apps for local first responders with its disaster mitigation and recovery kit, enabling emergency responders to record damage assessments right there on their cell phones. Uh, the Austin P Geographic Information Systems Office partnered with Montgomery County to create a web mapping application to assist residents in determining how far their property falls uh, in terms of specific distance from a volunteer fire station. That resulted in lower insurance safety office ratings that affects many county residents. Our Center for Excellence in Field Biology was awarded more than $300,000 from uh, the National Science Foundation to improve the infrastructure and ability of the collection uh, to be used by other scholars around the country. It includes more than $100,000, excuse me, 100,000 research specimens representing the state's largest collection of amphibians and reptiles and the second largest collection of plants and a growing collection of fish. Austin P. Botanists were involved in a recent publication of a comprehensive guide identifying all of Tennessee's nearly 3,000 vascular plants. I didn't understand the significance of that. They told me it took 50 years to do, and it replaced a volume that was more than 100 years old. So military history is pretty important right now to most of us in the United States. And George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And two of our professors just edited a massive two-volume military work of the Rutledge Handbook of American Military and Diplomatic History. Our field biology uh, exploits really are conducted by a number of, of botanists, but one of our professors recruited, was recruited by the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, an international scientific research and learning center focused on plant conservation as a biodiversity explorer and curator of the Vanderbilt Herbarium. And I just am pleased to report that we didn't let him go. He's working for both of us. And uh, finally, but not least, TSU is uh, specializing in research areas related to agriculture, engineering, data sciences, and health disparities. And they're partnering with private industry, national labs, and federal agencies to provide local and national solutions. And what that really means is they got their largest number of newer, newest uh, grants last year. They got over $50 million in funding for research last year, which is really amazing. And a team of their astronomers recently discovered a planetary system. But they don't do, uh, they do a lot more than just reach for the stars. They're also studying prevention of foodborne illnesses that have application in every city in America. And so that's what our Tennessee universities are about. Any questions? Any questions or comments for Dr. White? I, I'd just like to make a comment. I really appreciate that uh, report. It's very fascinating. I think that the great thing about our system is that it's a system of different kinds of um, higher in, in, uh, institutions of higher um, learning. And as we're thinking all the time about the pursuit of degrees and certificates, I think it's important for us to also remember that we're also about the pursuit of knowledge, the discovery of advanced knowledge, and, um, and not 
and, and they go together. So I, I think that's very fascinating and I just applaud all of our four-year institutions for the work that they're doing. Well said. That was a wow. Thank you. Thank so, you so much. Dr. Farwell, anything from a faculty perspective? Is our new faculty region on that report? Thank you for asking. I'd just like to reiterate that it is a lot of time and energy that the faculty do put into research. Um, it's one of three things that we are expected to do, teaching, research, and service. And for new faculty, sometimes it's hard to find that balance. So when we're recognized for our research, it really does mean so very much to us, and we appreciate being recognized for that. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. The journey of discovery is well underway in Tennessee, so thank you all. Dr. Boyer, I believe, is here to present our report for our community colleges. And you folks haven't had much going on at all. No. <laughs> what an exciting what time. With all our free time. Well, Madam Chair, uh, congratulations on that recent thank award. You. So we're really proud of you and thank all you, you do. And members of the board and, and Chancellor Morgan. Um, last time when I reported at Columbia State, we talked about workforce and we saw an example of a student who was out there in cooperative education and preparing for a really good job. Um, today I'd like to continue the conversation about research. Um, in the community colleges, we're really focused on teaching, but to do a good job in teaching, we need to research our methods of teaching and need to research ways to improve learning, so we do a lot of that. And we also are concerned about advancing knowledge um, and making discoveries, and so lots of things are going on. And as you know, we've got two new, three new presidents uh, to help us uh, do all this work. Uh, we're really happy this, to have them at this board meeting, their first board meeting, Dr. Tracy Hall and Dr. Flora Tidings and Dr. Tony Kinkle. So when I put out the call for uh, ideas and what's going on in research, they were right there. They, they came up with some great things already going on at their institutions, and I know things that they'll work to continue. Uh, Dr. Hall at Southwest talked about a dual enrollment student, uh, or students actually, at Hamilton High School that are working in an introduction to biology course, and they're doing research that uh, is based on Men Mendel's uh, experiments and work in genetics. They're working with, firefly or with fruit flies, um, so all kinds of things are happening with these uh, high school kids who are taking a college course. And they're going to be presenting their research at the uh, Tennessee Lewis Stokes Alliance of Minority Participation Undergraduate Research Conference. It's coming up this coming spring. So that was wonderful to see. We all know about uh, Northeast uh, iPad experiment with students and student learning. So Dr. Gillum is working to follow all of that, and I think we'll probably hear a report in March after their first semester and see what a difference that, um, that kind of intervention in a classroom is making at Northeast. Uh, at Motlow State with Dr. Kinkle, uh, they're working, they have a, uh, a, an honors program, which many of us have, so those students report during a major honors symposium. Uh, probably Dr. Ms. Fran Markham's been there, I'm sure. Uh, but the community comes out to hear what these students are doing, and uh, they uh, not only report there at Motlow State, but they go on to a, a Tennessee uh, Collegiate Honors Council and report. So getting these students out to see what their other uh, colleagues or their other students are doing. So there's lots of things to talk about. I know uh, also at Chattanooga, Dr. Tidings, they have a faculty fellows program and faculty in sonography and accounting and also in math and science are doing all kinds of interesting research there. But I think the, the best way to kind of understand what's going on is to see some, hear from some actual researchers. So this morning, we're going to hear from uh, Jackson State's very own Dean of Allied Health and Computer Information Systems. I appreciate uh, President Blanding and his office and he, uh, Heather Freeman uh, finding Dr. Pig and talking him into making this presentation for us. So I'd like to invite Dr. Pig to come up, and he's got some colleagues he wants to introduce and just give us a brief uh, snippet of what's going on in his research. So Dr. Pig. Thank you, Dr. Boyer, and thank you. 
Well, I appreciate the uh, invitation. Uh, uh, this about, um, I guess it's probably been five, six, seven years ago, uh, I addressed the board um, when we became a National Center of Academic Excellence in uh, Information Assurance at the two-year level. Uh, the previous speaker had mentioned the University of Memphis is the only research uh, uh, National Center of Academic Excellence. We're the only community college that has this designation. Uh, this is a designation that uh, comes from the, the uh, Department of Homeland Security and the National Security Agency, and we're one of approximately 33 community colleges across the nation that hold this designation. Uh, so we're real proud of that. Uh, we're also proud of the fact that we partner with the University of Memphis on several things. Um, I will be talking specifically about a research project that we're involved in right now, but a couple of past uh, projects that we've worked on. Uh, Dr. Judith Simon uh, worked with us and uh, Tennessee Tech in Cookville uh, for a Women in Cybersecurity uh, grant, NSF grant, several years ago, and uh, we're still kind of going with that. It's been very uh, instrumental in, in uh, uh, holding conferences and so forth that that we've had some key speakers in the field that uh, uh, have spoke about the need for more women in cybersecurity and cyber defense. Um, we've also, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dipanker Descupta is uh, another gentleman that I work with. He's actually the the chair of the uh, the center that was mentioned earlier. And uh, we've worked on several uh, occasions for on several projects and several grants. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, grant that we are currently working on, and I, let's see if this is, ah, it worked, great. Uh, we call it the Puzzle-Based Learning Project Grant. This is a, a National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Grant. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, the ATE grants, these are primarily, uh, they focus on two-year community colleges. That's the major reason for this funding. Uh, and it is a little bit odd, but not totally unusual. Uh, for uh, a university to be involved in this. As long as what the university is doing is benefiting community colleges, um, they're allowed to be part of this grant. Uh, Jackson State is the lead on this grant. University of Memphis is, um, uh, actually I'm the project lead, uh, but Dr. Das, uh, Descupta is uh, the lead for the team at the University of Memphis. And, and they pretty much do help us with uh, getting some advice on content and the like. But if you notice just the, the, real quickly, the goal of the project is to improve the effectiveness of cybersecurity education through puzzle-based learning, uh, expanding student knowledge and problem-solving skills through the stimulation of their cognitive abilities. Uh, and then going on, the successful implementation of this project will improve defensive skills of students pursuing a career in the networking computer systems and computer networking support specialist occupations which includes those enrolled in the uh, cybersecurity courses. And just kind of a quick um, piece on the cybersecurity courses. Uh, recently, uh, we went through a curriculum realignment in the computer area across the state for the community colleges. Uh, I, I guess right now we're gonna, instead of being called uh, computer information systems, we're now gonna be called computer information technology students. We're real proud of our, our program. And one of the um, concentrations that uh, several of us really pushed for was a cyber defense uh, com uh, concentration. And this concentration um, is gonna help other community colleges across the state obtain this National Center of Academic Excellence status. And so that's, that's kind of a, a byproduct of everything that's kind of going on. Uh, just real quickly, what this is, this, uh, the, the PBL uh, for short, pro uh, problem-based learning, this is a three-year project. Uh, we're currently just starting year two of the project. We do have two project teams, uh, of course, here at Jackson State and one at University of Memphis. Um, here is most of my team here at Jackson State. Uh, we have uh, Stacy Hendren, uh, who uh, is, is really what, what we, we call the project lead here at Jackson State. Uh, then next to Stacy is Nick Todd. He is one of our students that's working on the project. Um, then we have uh, um, Josh Britt, and Josh is uh, uh, one of our faculty in the math department. And uh, finally, Andrew Stutz is a student uh, working on the project. And we have one other student, uh, his name is Richard Yang. He could not be here today. Um, and, but anyway, he's, th these are all very important parts of this uh, project. Um, the primary focus of this project is to develop a variety of different types of puzzles. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, that will help to enhance the learning of community college students. Um, there has been some limited research um, in this area of, of 
puzzle-based learning. Uh, actually, it, it kind of started out in Australia uh, with uh, really kind of in the math, uh, the math division uh, and uh, kind of that, we kind of a spin off of that, taking a spin off of that. Uh, Dr. Descoupt and myself got together about two years ago and started talking about the possibilities and really kind of discovered nobody else has done this. But anyway, what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're developing puzzles. Uh, we actually have um, some limited versions of the puzzles right now that are in a mobile app form uh, with today's students and pretty much everybody having a, some type of a smartphone. Uh, you know, we thought we would definitely want to uh, focus some of our puzzles uh, on that. Also, um, you, you might, may or may not be familiar with some of the uh, platforms that I, I list here in the uh, uh, PowerPoint. Unity 3D, Blender, Unreal. These are our gaming platforms that those who build games for computers and Xboxes and things like that might use to develop uh, different types of, of games or, or uh, maybe puzzles and so forth. Um, we've also used Visual Basic uh, programming, and uh, there's another um, platform. It's called Articulate Storyline. That's more for um, content to be able to to uh, be able to deliver content to the students to prepare them to be able to uh, perform these puzzles or whatever you want to call them. Okay, and we're still kind of in, like I said, the early stages where we're not completely. We don't really have a full-blown puzzle just yet, but we're real close. Uh, and the students that I've got here, primarily, we've got them focusing on the, the gaming platform aspect. Um, some of the ideas that we've had is to create kind of a adventure game type of a platform to where, you know, maybe the student may find themselves in some type of a room and they've got to figure out how to get out, kind of an escape room type of a a situation and so basically they'll have to solve puzzles that will be related to the cyber security or cyber defense type specifically things like authentication encryption things like that to be able to escape out of these rooms and so um, that's kind of what we're what we're currently working on or the students are working on um, and we do have some students at the University of Memphis that are also working on this and we have plans to get the students from here and the University of Memphis together to, uh, to be able to, to work on this project. Um, basically, we're hoping to have the kind of the first pilot of our first puzzle in the spring of this year, or spring of 2016. Uh, we're gonna have a follow-up workshop for faculty, community college faculty in the summer uh, that will help to introduce this, uh, this concept to them and hopefully be able to roll that out at their institutions to enhance that learning. Uh, and then hopefully in the fall, when I say widespread dissemination, that mainly meaning the community colleges. Um, we, but I, I do mean even beyond Tennessee. Um, with our uh, National Center of Academic Excellence uh, designation, we have a lot of contact with a lot of community colleges and universities across the nation. And uh, we have uh, presented this idea over the last year at different conferences and so forth, uh, and there's been a lot of interest shown. Um, we, uh, we're wanting to end this thing with a type of capture the flag type uh, competition. This is, this is a, a fairly common thing, but we want to kind of focus more on the uh, related to the puzzles that we're developing and so forth. So uh, really don't have time, but there, we do have a, a YouTube uh, video that Josh has produced uh, that kind of demonstrates a few of our uh, uh, projects that we're currently working on. Uh, we do have a website. Uh, graciously, the University of Memphis has helped us out there and is hosting the website for us. Um, we are actually, we've got some upcoming presentations. Uh, the National Science Foundation has their annual Advanced Technological Education uh, PI conference in DC um, in the uh, near the end of October. So we'll have a showcase there to show what we've done so far. Uh, the University of Memphis, uh, their Cybersecurity Summit, which comes up the mid part of October, will have a part in that. Uh, actually, this is where we've been partnering with Dr. Descupta uh, and Dr. Simon uh, in helping to develop a pre-summit workshop for uh, attendees to kind of enhance that, that summit. Uh, and then there's a couple of other uh, 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 conferences that'll happen next summer that we're hoping that we'll be able to do some presentations at. Uh, the Colloquium of Information System Security is kind of the big conference for cybersecurity type folks across the nation. Uh, and then there's a specific one for community colleges. Uh, I do appreciate your uh, uh, 
uh, inviting me again, and uh, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Questions or comments for Dr. Pig and his team? I'm just glad that smart people like all of you, in collaboration with other smart people at the <laughs> University of Memphis, are working on what is truly one of the biggest issues of our time and possibly beyond, so well done. Any other thoughts or comments? Amazing, thank you for sharing that with us. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Rudd, thank you for Memphis's commitment and engagement as well, very impressive. Well, that's a great example, I think. Thank you. So not only informing their teaching, but they're advancing knowledge too. And one last example here, uh, Paris Powers, who's Associate Professor of Chemistry and uh, President Jerry Faulkner at of all State has um, made all this uh, possible. They also have a National Science Foundation Community College Undergraduate Research Initiative project. And we have a student here from um, Vol State who's going to make the pres a short presentation on his research. And uh, thank Dr. Kimberly Martin, who is uh, Director of Institutional Effectiveness at Vol State, and she's about to become our new Vice President for Institutional Advancement. So anyway, she's doing double duty here, but uh, we're, we're happy to have her here and to help us with this. But Alan Corbett Jackson is a volunteer state student. He's a transfer student. Um, you know, in community colleges, about half, about probably 55 to 60 percent of our students are transfer, getting ready to go to the universities we've just heard from, and about 45 to 40 percent are preparing to go immediately to work. So, Alan is one who's looking at um, transferring. He uh, presented a poster on his research on chemical pretreatment of switchgrass. So, Mr. Johnson, right down your alley here. Uh, potential biofuel feedstock at the 2014 uh, Poster Symposium in Phoenix, Arizona. He's planning to transfer as a pre-med student. Corvette is a trained emergency medical technician. He works at Vanderbilt Hospital Trauma Center on the weekends. In addition he, to going to class, conducting research, working, he's an accomplished musician and songwriter, and he's performed on stage with the other Alan Jackson. Oh, but cool. we're gonna call him Corbett. So Corbett, you wanna come on up and talk about your research? Thank you. Are you, you going to perform your presentation today? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Excellent. I think that's funny that uh, Paris included some of that stuff, but anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, good day. Good day. Um, I would like to thank you all for the time and allowing me to be here to uh, speak a little bit on how being involved in undergraduate research has enhanced my academic experience. Um, my name is Corbett Jackson. I'm currently a full-time student at Vol State Community College in Gallatin, Tennessee with a concentration in chemistry. And upon, uh, com upon graduating this upcoming spring, I intend to transfer to a four-year institution where I will continue my academic career in biochemistry and anthropology. Um, I became, in, I became involved in undergraduate research um, during my second semester at Vol State Community College and I guess I'll just click this here. There we go. Works. Okay. And uh, here listed are some of the research projects that have been embedded into the chemistry and science curriculum at Vol State. Um, I've been involved in three of the five here. And one being the acidic and basic pretreatments of ligonocellulosic um, material, plant tissue is basically what that is. Um, and this basically, uh, essentially what we were doing here is we were investigating the techniques to extract glucose from the ligand so it could later be used in synthesizing um, ethanol or what we would refer to in this process as biofuel. Also, various methods in yielding flavones by means of green and micro scale techniques. Um, essentially what this consisted of is um, flavones, which intrinsically are natural occurring compounds in plant tissue that have a, um, a vast array of medicinal properties. A genomic annotation, this has been implemented into our bio biology courses at Vol State. Um, this basically consists of constructing a species genome um, solely based on its phylogenetic characteristics. And I'm currently, read, uh, currently leading a research project in which we are currently working to determine the top 10 solvents found in vapor cigarette um, juices. Yeah, so uh, once we determine the top 10 solvents, 
that will allow us to ascertain the solubility, which will then help us to determine the, um, determine the actual toxicity of the chemical compounds based on their properties. Um, and also I'd like to include that a, a lot of that is secondary research, not all scientific research is done in a laboratory, so that's something I'm, I'm certainly taking from that experience. Um, some of the benefits, there are so many, but I've, I've included a few that I, that I find salient. Um, it is crucial to develop skills that allow a research team to construct a salubrious work environment. There's a lot of communication. Um, there is a lot of exchanging ideas and being open to other people's ideas, learning when to take that leadership role and when to sit back and listen. That is something that I've certainly taken away from my experience. Uh, and while there's a lot of collaboration in research, um, it is also a great opportunity to develop individual skills such as work ethic, um, the ability to think critically and problem solve. And I can certainly relate to this. Some of the applications I've been able to make in my core curriculum definitely do stem from the knowledge that I've acquired from undergraduate research. Uh, producing a professional PowerPoint, although I was told there were some resolution issues, I will take that with me. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, and presenting it with proficiency to an audience, or designing and leading, when necessary, an undergraduate research project. Um, I would not be able to do these things efficiently as, a, as an academic scholar had I not become involved in the undergraduate research experience um, in, in some instances. And another thing is you absolutely get to explore your interest and discover what you're truly passionate about. When I first, uh, when I first came to Vol State, I knew that chemical engineering was what I wanted to do. Definitely not. Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly not. But I was able to, just like a lot of my, as so many of my colleagues and other undergraduate research students, um, Due to that first-hand exposure, I was able to determine that through my research, I, was, I had other interests, and I'm, I'm being able to carry that out now. Um, all of these are great benefits, uh, but for me, the last one is the take-home, uh, and it's simply because augmenting professional, augmenting professional and academic credentials dispenses long-term benefits. It really does. And why be involved in anything that doesn't have some sort of longevity to it? Um, when you go to apply to an institution or whether, you know, maybe it, it be a, um, a job, when they review that, again, whether this is by a committee, a professional, or a um, <clears throat> graduate program, or potential place of employment, having been involved in these types of studies immediately reveals leadership skills, um, ability to communicate and work efficiently within a group, and perhaps even that he or she has procured those lab skills that will ensure quality research. And that is just extremely advantageous when it comes to applying to those types of programs and endeavors. Um, this last spring, we uh, had the opportunity to travel to a national symposium. We were the only community college out of 80 other universities at the um, at the conference, and we actually won the award for, um, for in the or organic chemistry division, which was a, quite an accomplishment, and this is the poster that we did so with. Um, I would like to thank you all for, again for your time and allow me to speak, Dr. Boyd, for thank you for having me. And uh, I, 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 I feel obligated to thank Curry for supporting and aiding us in the development of the undergraduate research program at Vol State and providing us with the opportunities at, for travel and the experience of pre, to present our, our research. And uh, we've been to Washington, D.C., at Capitol Hill twice. I've been to Philadelphia, Phoenix, Charlotte. And some really exciting news is that preliminary discussions are underway um, for Vol State Community College to potentially host the National Undergraduate Research Symposium in April of 2016. I'd also like to express my gratitude to uh, Dr. Faulkner and Dr. Pimentel at Vol State Community College for advocating undergraduate research um, and enabling students like myself to not only prosper academically, but personally as well. And uh, thank you for your time. Chair, that concludes our report. So oh thank my you. goodness, thank another you. wow. Thank you, Corbett. I was watching the faces around this table. I think we're all blown away. So, and may we remind you that we have six great public universities to which you can matriculate in the Tennessee Board of Regents system.
Thank you very much. Well done. Wow. And to your colleagues and to Dr. Faulkner, um, out of the park. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Dwight Murphy, more exciting news from our community, I mean from our Tennessee Colleges of Applied Technology as well. And we thank you and your colleagues for sponsoring our breakfast this morning too. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, chair and Regents and our Chancellor. Uh, great to be here. I have uh, admired Chancellor Morgan's leadership for many years, and I try to mirror that. So at this time, uh, Shelly, Associate Vice Chancellor Shelly Travis is going to do most of my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Director Murphy, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, good morning, Chancellor Morgan, Vice Chair Reynolds, and distinguished members of the Board of Regents. It is a pleasure for me to bring to you the 2015 TCAT Director's Report on Skills USA. America is facing a shortage of skilled technicians, and not only are we facing a shortage of skilled technicians, we are also facing a growing shortage of technicians with soft skills, such as leadership, communication, work ethics, and teamwork. SkillsUSA has been empowering its members to become world-class workers, leaders, and responsible citizens for over 50 years. With over 350,000 members nationwide and an average national conference attendance of over 15,000, SkillsUSA changes students' lives and helps to close the skills gap. Business and industry recognize the value of SkillsUSA's role in preparing the future workforce and closing the skills gap. Each year, industry partners from across the nation donate over $35 million to SkillsUSA championships in the form of human capital, equipment, materials, and prizes. In fact, with over 1,600 corporate volunteers, the SkillsUSA National Championships represent the largest single day of corporate volunteerism in America. With names like Snap-on, Lowe's, State Farm, Caterpillar, Air Products, Carhartt, and many others making considerable monetary donations each year. This year alone, the Alcoa Foundation donated over $250,000 to support the SkillsUSA World Skills Team in Sao Paulo, Brazil. We're very proud to report that of the 19 World Skills Team members, four of those were TCAT students. Two graduates from TCAT Knoxville were on the Manufacturing Team Challenge, and two graduates from Chattanooga were on the Mechatronics Team, representing the United States at World Skills, and they did an excellent job representing us and the Board of Regents. In addition, Nissan hired eight of our SkillsUSA competitors off the competition floor last year and returned to the state and national competitions to assist by organizing competitions, providing prizes to winners, and interviewing prospective employees. According to Wayne Ellington, a supervisor of maintenance and engineering at Nissan in Smyrna, what separates SkillsUSA from other competitions and clubs is the professionalism shown by the competitors. By looking sharp, wearing uniforms appropriate for the skills involved, having a prepared resume, and being able to field questions about their skill during interviews are all important things that quickly can be picked up by hiring managers. These are the basic characteristics of a true professional that are just as essential as the skills that are being sought. In order to attract more college students to SkillsUSA, last year one financial partner donated funds to develop marketing materials and training materials specifically aimed at adult students. Students, alumni, and instructors from the Tennessee Colleges of Applied Technology were selected to be the focus of these materials. This was an amazing experience and honor for our participants. At each of your seats today, you have an example of the cover of the 2015-16 SkillsUSA National Membership Kit. Four of the five photos on the cover of this kit are TCAT graduates. This is one of the examples of the materials that SkillsUSA will be using this year that feature our TCAT students, and these were submitted to the over 4,000 SkillsUSA chapters nationwide and you should be proud of your TCAC graduates that will be featured in these, um, in these training materials. Through their commitment of time, financial, materials, and resources to SkillsUSA, it is clear to see that business and industry value the contribution that SkillsUSA makes to providing America with a skills workforce. They see the end result of a SkillsUSA education as a well-rounded, 
well-trained, career-ready student who is prepared not only to satisfy demands, but to exceed expectations. Next, I would like to share with you the outstanding results of the performance of our TCAT students during the 2015 SkillsUSA National Conference. The TCATs were rep represented well at the SkillsUSA National Conference in Louisville this summer, with over 230 attendees, including competitors, state and national officers, delegates, advisors, administrators, and business and industry guests. During the National Conference, 97 TCAT students from across the state entered 64 contests. Tennessee post-secondary representation shined on awards night, receiving a total of 42 medals, 12 gold, 7 silver, and 23 bronze. A total of 80 TCAT students from the TCAT system placed in the top 10 nationally. In addition, Tennessee uh, actually had its eighth consecutive national officer elected, Mr. David Boss II, an HVAC student from TCAT Knoxville. Beyond the election of officers and competitions, TCAT Harriman was one of only 24 SkillsUSA chapters recognized as a model of excellence of the over 4,000 SkillsUSA chapters nationwide. And we want to also note that it was the only post-secondary chapter to receive this honor. The Ball of Excellence Awards are the pinnacle of the National Organization's Chapter Excellent Program, which honors chapter achievement relative to the SkillsUSA framework of developing personal, workplace, and technical skills grounded in academics. By centering on industry demands, the SkillsUSA framework builds a foundation for relevant learning and employability skill development. We are very proud of TCAT Harriman and the leadership of their director, Dennis Turpin, and their SkillsUSA lead advisor, Angela Richardson, for the recognition that they received and the tremendous job that they do with SkillsUSA at TCAT Harriman. Normally each year, our newly elected national officer brings to you the final portion of our presentation. However, David, along with several of our national and world skill competitors, could not be here today due to work commitments. However, it is my pleasure to introduce to you, uh, to the board, our 2015 National Welding Sculpture Medalist and a TCAT Crump welding student, Mr. Philip Boyd, to close our presentation. Philip? Thank you all. It's, it's an honor to be here today. I really, really do thank you for the opportunity. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to be here and represent Skills USA. I was fortunate enough to represent Tennessee College of Applied Technology, Crump, at the Skills USA State Conference in Welding Sculpture. There I won a gold medal. Winning the gold medal at state gave me the opportunity to compete against state medalists from across our nation. In front of you all, there's a gold medal. I would like for you to pick it up and place it around your necks, please. Now indulge me, and please, for just a moment, close your eyes, and imagine yourself standing on a stage, blinding lights in front of 15,000 people. Now open your eyes. Your life has just been changed, like that. Now give me a few minutes to tell you my story. My father's name is Joseph. He is the inspiration for my sculpture and so named Joe Conundrum. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and congestive heart failure, and I became his primary care provider. If you've had the opportunity to look at my sculpture, you will see various components that represent my idea of the effects Alzheimer's has had on my father. From the question mark on his face, the puzzle pieces that represent fragments of his life, to the hands scratching his head in wonder, just attempting to figure out where could Waldo be? All this represent his daily struggles. This adventure provided me the opportunity to earn a gold medal at the Skills USA National Conference in Louisville, Kentucky. With thousands of people screaming, music blaring, and the wonder of whose name was going to be called next to walk up on the stage. And all I could think about was the last conversation I had with my dad. He said, Sean, you either bring home a gold medal or you bring home some chocolate milk. 
Oh, and if you don't have chocolate milk, you better find your own place to stay, guy. <laughs> and then at that moment, they, they called my name, Philip Boyd. And I knew my life was just changed in an instant of a name call. And then I thought on the way to the stage, man, he really loves his milk. <laughs> I hope you have somewhat of an idea of how I felt to be a Skills USA national champion and how I felt to have the opportunity to pay homage to my father. In September of 2014, I realized I had my father and myself to provide for. Seeking a marketable skill that would accomplish this, I chose to attend the welding technology program at TCAT Crump. Having no prior at all, no prior knowledge of welding, period. I really began to think I was in over my head. But much to my surprise, a man by the name of James Overstreet, my instructor, somehow saw my potential. And Mr. Overstreet strongly encouraged me to continue my education along with the responsibilities I had to my father. After enrolling in the program, later on I heard other students talking about an organization called Skills USA which every student in the TCAT system is already a member. And the best part of all, it's at no cost to the student. With only having lint in my pockets, this was right up my alley. <laughs> I've always been kind of a loner and stuck to myself in social situations, but something told me that this was a great opportunity to network with other students in my program and on campus. What I did not realize I had no idea that this organization would, at a minimum, help to build confidence, self-esteem, team working, communication, and leadership skills that I would need to succeed in today's workforce. The scoring process of my competition was not only the sculpture, that was certainly the easy part, but it required a notebook documenting the design and creation of my project from start to finish. For example, concept sketches, photographs, and organization of the notebook. Having limited for photography skills and Microsoft Office skills, I was forced to rely on other students to assist me in these areas. Working as a team allowed me to practice many of the soft skills that are promoted by Skills USA, such as public speaking, interview techniques, and presentation skills, all skills that are sought by employers. As a gold medal winner, I received prizes from corporate sponsors. I received a plasma cutter, a TIG welder, and a MIG welder. These resources will permit me to work from home and continue to care for my father. The prizes provided the needed equipment to develop my own business. However, feeling the need to improve my business skills, I chose to return to TCAT in order to enhance my knowledge of accounting and customer service. And this return also allows me to continue my participation in our Skills USA chapter. On behalf of all the Skills USA participants, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for supporting Skills USA instructors and advisors. Without your hard work, assistance, and above all dedication, we would not be in front of the board today. I would especially like to thank my director, Stephen Milligan, my advisors, Regina Wyatt and Brian Harris, and my instructor, James Overstreet, for their support and for ensuring that I was truly prepared for my competition. Also, I would like to recognize Ms. Regina Wyatt. Ms. Wyatt is our 2015 Tennessee Advisor of the Year. Under her leadership, TCAT Crump has developed a fully active chapter with student leadership, faculty participation, and community input that reaches beyond the local level. In addition, I would like to thank all of the TCAT directors and the TCAT system especially Vice Chancellor James King. Without their support, the success of the statewide Skills USA program would not be possible for us to become champions at work. As demonstrated in our performance at Nationals this year, our Skills USA participants are truly champions at work in their technical fields, leadership, and community service. And at this time, I would like to recognize three of the other gold medalists that could be with us today and their advisors. Now please remember that most of our medalists have graduated and are working in their field of study. As I call your names, please stand. Gold medalist in collision repair from Knoxville, Jedediah Long. His instructor is Keith Kuhn and advisor is Boyd Heston. Gold medalist in job skill demo from Chattanooga, 
Tiffany Hammond. Her massage therapy instructor is Renee Richardson. Gold medalist in robotics, urban search, and rescue from Whiteville. Arsenio Taylor. His industrial electricity instructor is Joshua Mobley, and his advisor is Jaqueen Winfield. And in closing, the Tennessee Colleges of Applied Technology have truly changed my life. And they have changed the lives of thousands of Tennesseans each year, just as they have for the past 50 years. Madam Vice Chair, Madam Vice Chair this concludes the TCAT Director's Report. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Wow. Any comments or questions for Philip? Yes, Regent Shockey. I just want to know if that piece is for sale. Oh. <laughs> it is absolutely beautiful. It, it is really incredible. is. It is really a marketable piece. I'm very impressed. It is very impressive. And thank you for having the courage to share your story with us. Uh, it's very touching. But again, your work um, is just just outstanding. You're not just a champion at work, my friend. You are all champions as human beings, and we salute you. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Director Murphy, anything else, my friend? Well, I would like to call your attention to a couple of numbers that I think are amazing. Our fall enrollments across the state are up 26.1%. Wow. We've had the busiest... <laughs> We've had the busiest two weeks we've ever had in TCAT history. We've got them hanging from the rafters, and we're excited about the opportunity. 74% of the Promise eligible students showed up on September the 1st, which is quite a remarkable number. And we would like to, uh, like to call your attention to the newsletter, some great partnership uh, articles in the newsletter. And we'd like to welcome Stephen and Yolanda, our two newest directors, and congratulate you, Madam Chair, on the honor that you have. And thank Dr. Blanding and the folks at Jackson State. A marvelous night last night. Wonderful food this morning. Commissioner, I've never been around a barn like that. Growing up on a farm is a great meal. So subject to your questions, I think this concludes our report. I think Regent Griscom has I've a got one. Reconnect has started as well, correct? Mm -hmm. So do you have reconnect numbers? We do. Uh, those, are, those are finalizing. And Carol, can you help us with that number? Yes. Um, Regent Griscom, we don't have the percentage yet. I'm sorry. But um, I bet Russ is helping us figure those out right now. But the enrollment number was, let's see, Dwight, did you bring it up here? Enrollment number was, I think, about 4,700. Okay, no, I'm, I, I appreciate it. I'm just interested in the, you know, since we've talked about promise, the number of people took advantage of reconnect. The, the, you can give us the percentages later. I just okay. want to know how that program went and what we learn about it and, and that we can build from, from there. So thank you. Regent Barlin, Other Chair questions? of our Workforce Development Committee. Um, do you think, uh, and, and the numbers are just amazing in terms of the amount of increase of people that are gravitating to our community colleges, our TCATs. Um, do you have any insight or do you have anything to share about how you're dealing with that? I mean, okay, so you've got this much a percentage. How are these TCATs responding in terms of getting them in and not being on waiting list? We, we've had to be very creative in what we've done. Uh, we have more dual enrollment students at high schools than we've ever had. Uh, the LEAP grants have, have, uh, have had us develop partnerships that aren't haven't been there in the past in fact tomorrow I'll, I'll take a little uh, commercial break here to tell you that tomorrow Pellissippi Knox County school system 
and TCAT Knoxville are cutting the ribbon at, at the Pellissippi Strawberry Plains campus. You've got that going on with TCAT Athens and Cleveland. So those partnerships are out there and they're developing. We have to be more creative. We have to be more out of the box uh, as we go forward because there's a skills gap that all of us working together uh, can't fulfill. We're more accountable. I thank you for your committee and, and, and what you're, you're holding us accountable, and we should be, to make sure that we're training Tennesseans for the skills that, that are out there and that are needed because we're growing by leaps and bounds as a state in, uh, in economic development, and we need to have the folks ready to go to work. Would you say that we are responding in terms of um, our, our students that have taken advantage of this aren't hitting a wall and saying, okay, welcome, there's a two-year waiting list. How, how do you feel like Absolutely that? Absolutely not. Uh, at TCAT Knoxville, we open 10 new night programs. Uh, we're opening off-campus programs. And we have developed a line of communication with those promised students. We're in contact with them daily and weekly. We're keeping them informed of where we're at. Knoxville, Knoxville has a, a lot of students wanting in. We are committed to accommodate those students, and we're having to think outside the box to do it, but they will be. We are getting them in classes very quickly. Other questions? Questions, comments? Thank you again. Thank you. Well done. Um, and as Director Murphy reminded us, um, we all have from um, each branch of our system um, the highlight reports, which have even more good news and more exciting things uh, for us to read about. Well, I'll speak for myself here, but I, but I think it reflects just the faces and the interest around this table. The last, this last hour or so has been incredibly productive and insightful for us, so we thank our presidents and directors for the careful thought you put in uh, to presenting to us this morning on the research piece. And again, to Corbett and to our Skills USA folks, um, congratulations on a job well done. We thank you. You have, you have humbled us this morning, and it is our honor to serve this state and this system. Commissioner Johnson. I'd just like to re remind the committee, uh, you challenged us last year, Vice Chair, that uh, to be mentors. Mm -hmm. I was a mentor. The governor challenged the cabinet to be a mentor also. Uh, five of my seven uh, students are in, in school this fall, but here we start another year. Yep. We've got to re-sign our mentors. Yep. We've got to go through the process again. We've got to get those uh, community service projects fulfilled. That was uh, a problem this last year, waiting to the last moment to get those community yep. service projects fulfilled. i just like to encourage everyone to become a mentor. It's a great experience a good way to give back for all the things that we've been re rewarded in life and uh, thank you for your support of that thank you well put well put thank you it is time to sign up Tennessee achieves right is where is where we can go on and sign up to be mentors so great reminder Commissioner thank you very much Oh, we will now move on to our unfinished business, which um, will remain unfinished business. Um, I'm going to defer this item to December. We're not quite ready. Those who were at our committee chairs meeting in late August will recall we had a good discussion around some potential changes to the bylaws. With thanks to the chancellor and to our general counsel, Mary Moody, we are still working on those revisions. Um, but I have every confidence we will be back to you um, by the December meeting. Uh, to, to take care of that action. So thank you for your patience and understanding. Obviously, with our bylaws, we just need to get it right. Um, and so we'll continue that work here over the next couple of months. We'll now move into the final portion of our program this morning. And our first item under new business is to um, approve our 2016 proposed meeting dates. And we have some exciting plans in store with our campus visits this year, next year, rather, Chancellor. Well, we do, and, th and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think uh, each of you have been provided with a, uh, a list of the proposed dates and locations for the 2000, uh, for the next year's uh, meetings. Uh, Wednesday, March 30th. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I think it was, uh, I hope it was in the packet. It should have been uh, in our packet. But I'll, I'll read them out to you yeah, so you'll okay. know this. Thank you, just uh, in case. Wednesday, March 30th, um, and, and I don't want folks at Columbia State to panic about this. Um, we, you, you've done your service already, but uh, uh, because we couldn't get the facility uh, within the Genesco bu building for that date, uh, we are hoping to be able to hold the 
uh, the Wednesday, uh, March 30th meeting at the New Williamson County campus uh, in the, the large activity room. It's, it's going to be a push. Uh, it, we may have to all bring our lawn chairs with us as we, uh, as we to, to sit in that room. Uh, but I want to assure Columbia State it will be a zero burden proposition for y'all. It, it's, it's, uh, th this one's on us. Uh, but we hope that that uh, facility is ready for that. If it's not, we'll find an alternative for that. Uh, Thursday and Friday, June 23rd and 24th, uh, Northeast State Community College uh, will be up in East Tennessee. Thursday and Friday, September 15th and 16th, uh, President Rudd, get ready. We'll be in Me University of Memphis, so we'll be at the other end of the state. Uh, and then, as usual, our December meeting uh, will be at the system office. Uh, we uh, don't necessarily know exactly where that will be. Uh, <coughs> But, but, but we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, keep us posted on that yeah, one. We'll keep you posted. <laughs> so that's our recommendations for the, for the meeting schedule for next year. Yeah, I do. Thank you, Regent Freeman. A second from Regent Prescott. Any further discussion? So, and Sanja, just a note, would you make sure we get these dates back around? That'd be great. That'd be great. Just out of an abundance of caution. So thank you. Hearing no discussion, this is a roll. Uh, this is a voice vote. Rather, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. We have a good 16 schedule, so something to look forward to. I would now like to call on Regent Roddy to present the minutes of the Personnel and Compensation Committee and the report of a special called meeting from September 2nd. Regent Roddy. Thank you, Vice Chair Reynolds. The Personnel and Compensation Committee met in regular session yesterday to review and recommend approval of the following items. Tenure upon appointment, revisions to the Executive Performance Incentive Plan, institutional compensation increases, and approval of the minutes of the special call meeting on September 2nd, 2015. As the chair of this committee, I move that the board approve the report of the September 16th, 2015 meeting of the Committee on Personnel and Compensation as presented. Now, approval of this report requires an all, a roll call vote. Thank you, Regent Roddy. We have his motion. We need a second. Second from Regent Freeman. Any discussion on this item? Hearing none, Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Regent Duckett? Aye. Regent Farwell? Aye. Regent Freeman? Aye. Regent Griscom? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Regent Markham? Aye. Regent Prescott? Aye. Regent Reynolds? Aye. Regent Roddy? Aye. Regent Russell? Aye. Regent Shockey? Aye. Regent Smith? Aye. Regent Thomas? Aye. Regent Varlin? Aye. The motion carries unanimous. Thank you very much. We will now uh, look at the minutes of the Finance and Business Operations Committee from yesterday, which includes the important presentation we heard from Vice Chancellor Gregory on our capital budget and the capital match funding report. Regent Duckett? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. The Finance and Business Operation Committee met in regular session yesterday. The committee reviewed and recommends approval of the following items. Two consent agenda items, uh, the capital budget recommendations for fiscal year 2016-17, which includes $194,308,000 for capital outlay and $118,940,000 for capital maintenance. Thirdly, the system budget request for fiscal year 2016-17, which totals approximately $16.1 million, $3 million uh, of which are recurring dollars, and $13.1 million is non-recurring dollars. As chair of the committee, I move that the board approves as presented the report of the September 16th, 2015 15 meeting of the Committee on Finance and Business Operations, and this is a item that also requires a roll call vote. Thank you. Motion from Regent Duckett as our committee chair, second from Regent Freeman. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Regent Duckett? Aye. Regent Farwell? Aye. Regent Freeman? Aye. Regent Griscom? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Regent Markham? Aye. Regent Prescott? Aye. Regent Reynolds? Aye. Regent Aye. <laughs> Regent Roddy? Aye. Regent Nut Russell? Aye. Regent Shockey? Aye. Regent Smith? Aye. Regent Thomas? Aye. Regent Varlin? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Good work to the Finance Committee. Thank you. We now have two building naming requests, both at Middle Tennessee State University. Um, and the board will act on these and then invite uh, President McPhee to the podium to make remarks. Um, Chancellor, I will call on you to take us through these, please, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, on September 23rd, 1994, 21 years ago, the board approved the naming of the Mass Communication Building at MTSU in honor of Representative John Bragg. Uh, in May of this year, the College of Mass Communications name was changed to the College of Media and Entertainment. MTSU is therefore requesting that the building reflect the new name for the college and be named the John Bragg Media and Entertainment Building. Uh, Madam Chair, I recommend to the board that we approve, uh, consider and approve this name change. Thank you, sir. So move, Regent Freeman, thank you, a proud MTSU alumnus. So, absolutely. We need a second, please. Second from. Regent Griscom, who understands media and entertainment and all things journalism, so thank you. Uh, this simply requires a roll, I mean a voice vote if there's no further discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. And that department is the home of yep. Regent, Regent, that's Farwell. exactly, right. Regent yeah. Farwell as well. All right, excellent. And a fitting tribute to John Bragg. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And his wonderful family. Um, Chancellor, once again, um, another building, re a naming request. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. President McPhee also submitted a request to honor Mr. Andrew Woodfin Miller, Sr. for his substantial gift of $10 million to Middle Tennessee State University. Dear Middle Tennessee State University Centennial and the MTSU Centennial Campaign, uh, Mr. Miller made a pledge in April 2012 to contribute the sum of $10 million to be used to enable MTSU to purchase and renovate the property commonly referred to as the Bell Street Medical Arts Building. The building is part of the former Middle Tennessee Medical Center property that was purchased by the state for the benefit and use of MTSU in April 2013. The details of the pledge, I think, are shown in your materials. The commitment is for 10 million, or for 10 $1 million annual payments. Thus far, a total of $4 million has been co contributed. The building is now under renovation, should be open by the end of the calendar year. Occupants of the building will include the Jones College of Business Executive, Bi Jones College of Business Executive Business Program, the Center for Counseling and Psychological Services, the University College, the University Police Criminal Division Office, and the Center for Chinese Music and Culture. In recognition of this gift, MTSU agreed to seek approval to name the building in honor of Mr. Miller. The agreed upon name is the Andrew Woodfin Miller Senior Education Center. Madam Chair, I recommend that the board honor this request. Thank you. Once again, Regent Freeman, a second? Second. Second from Regent Thomas, thank you. Any discussion? Yet again, a great, a fitting tribute to Woody Miller. Um, this is a voice vote as well. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. President McPhee, good morning. Tell us about these two exciting names, uh, na one name change and one addition, rather. Thank you, and Madam Vice Chair, uh, members of this board, Chancellor Morgan and colleagues, it's certainly a pleasure to be here to uh, thank you as board for approving uh, the recommendation from the chancellor. I think we all uh, in Tennessee first know about uh, the chairman, uh, John Bragg, who served this state for many years uh, in the legislature and has been a true blue fan uh, for centuries. Um, his family continues to be involved with our university, former Mayor Bragg, Tommy Bragg, of the city of Murfreesboro. Although he graduated from that other university in East Tennessee, uh, you will never see him with that color on. He wears blue, he and his family. 
So with the change of the name of our college, uh, we felt it be appropriate to reflect and update the name of the building, and we appreciate your support and your approval of that recommendation. Uh, secondly, we appreciate the approval for the Andrew Woodfin Miller Senior. Uh, and I'm honored to recognize um, Andrew, who's known as, is known as Woody. Uh, he's been an incredible supporter of our university, and as you've heard, he's given the largest gift to date to our institution of $10 million uh, to our centennial campaign. And that gift, ladies and gentlemen, has served as a cornerstone uh, for our capital campaign, and we'll be announcing in a few weeks that we have blown the top of our initial um, uh, numbers that we put out three years ago for our capital campaign. Uh, his gift has allowed us and has leveraged several six and seven figure gifts since we announced the ten million dollars uh, from Woody. He was a first generation college student who tells me that without the education the MTSU, he would not be where he is today in terms of his financial worth. So thank you so much uh, for your approval and support of these two recommendation. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask you one, oh, one quick question? I'm sorry. Here we go. <laughs> Can you give us just 30 seconds of insight into the change to media and entertainment? Obviously, it's more reflective of where we are today, I suppose, but any insight? Yes, and we certainly are always, as a good president, will defer to my outstanding yes. faculty member who's in that. Uh, but um, a few years ago, we hired uh, a new dean of our college of then mass communication, an outstanding professional. Uh, Ken Paulson actually served as the editor of USA Today and uh, was a highly sought of candidate from around the country. We were able to um, encourage him and, and we won the battle. He's now the Dean of our College of Media and Entertainment. And when we hired him, we asked him, we've always had an outstanding mass communication college, rank in the top 20 in the nation, but we wanted to take our programs to the next level. With all the changes in the industry, we felt that it was time to do some self uh, introspection and evaluation of what we're doing and update our program. And there was about a year, a year and a half of discussion and deliberation among the faculty, uh, among industry folks as to how MTSU needs to take its program to the next level, already a top 20. Uh, and the results, there were like three or four names uh, discussed and deliberated on uh, the recommendation was media and entertainment. Professor, uh, Professor Farwell, would you like to add to that? Thank you, yeah. We really didn't take the name change um, lightly. It was something that we had several discussions over, um, occasionally heated discussions, but we came to what we felt was a name that represented what we did um, more, more fully than what mass communication does. Because we do have the recording industry program in the college, we have the um, electronic media, and we also have journalism, and then we have my area, which was advertising and public relations. So this really kind of represents what we do and where we're going to be going in the future. And you'll see a lot more changes coming from our college. We have a few more name changes and stuff coming down the pike. Exciting. Well done. And it's a real tribute to you, by the way, that the gift from, from Mr. Miller and your leadership in this capital campaign as well. So thank you for all you do. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> So these are always bittersweet moments as we acknowledge the service of one of our team. And today uh, we have a resolution of appreciation for one of our TCAT directors, David Brower, Browder, rather, excuse me. Um, Regent Varlin, I will call on you to read the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. This will be a resolution of appreciation for the service of Mr. David Browder to the Tennessee Board of Regents. Um, he was the director at Jacksboro. Whereas Dr. Mr. David Browder has faithfully served the Tennessee College of Applied Technology, Jacksboro, as director since 2002, 
And whereas he is a native of Lenore City, Tennessee, and graduated with a bachelor's degree in physical education secondary in 1980, and received his master's degree in health and physical education from Tennessee Technological University in 1981, and whereas he served as a middle school teacher and high school coach in Marietta, Georgia, and was selected as Georgia's Teacher of the Year in 1984. Returning to Tennessee in 1987, Mr. Browder began his career in the Tennessee Board of Regents system, serving as the county supervisor for the job training office at Rome State Community College. He served as campus coordinator at the Loudoun County Higher Education Center and as program monitor for Job Training Partnership Act. While at Rome State Community College from 1980 to 1985, worked at Tennessee Technological University as the Assistant Director for Extended Education from 1995 to 1997, and as the Program Development Specialist at Rome State Community College in the Job Training Partnership Act Administrative Office in Kingston from 1997 to 1999. He was named Assistant Director at the Tennessee College of Applied Technology, Jacksboro from 2000 to 2002, and served as Director from 2002 to 2015. And whereas he holds the distinction of working in all three divisions of the Tennessee Board of Regents and providing 30 years of service in the field of higher education in Tennessee. And whereas he has served in numerous leadership roles with the Tennessee Board of Regents to include the first TCAT leadership class in 2001, the statewide TCAT Directors Executives Club Council from 2006 to 2008, and again 2014 to 2015, and as chairman of the TCAT Leadership Development Program for six years, and as chairperson of the Business Systems Technology and Industrial Electrical Technology Curriculum Committees. And whereas he was a Chamber of Commerce member in Campbell County with two terms on the board and a member of the American Technical Education Association. And whereas he was chosen as the winner of the Dr. Flavia Smith Distinguished Alumni Award, Alumnus Award at the Tennessee Technological University Annual Exercise Science Physical Education and Wellness Banquet in 2015, and whereas he was instrumental in promoting the legislation that changed the names of the Tennessee Technology Centers to the Tennessee College of Applied Technology, and whereas he shall be missed by fellow colleagues, faculty, staff, students, and community leaders, and alumni of the Tennessee College of Applied Technology, Jacksboro. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the members of the Tennessee Board of Regents wish to recognize the outstanding career of Do Mr. David Browder and express appreciation for his superb leadership. Thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate so much. Uh, David, is he here? No, I think he's he had was. some surgery, but is yes. watching us live streaming oh, good. today. So, good. <laughs> absolutely. Well, we are so appreciative of the service he has given to the Tennessee Board of Regents and specifically to our Tennessee College of Applied Technology at Jacksboro. And uh, we will miss you, David, and hope you are feeling better soon. Absolutely. Yep. Any other, what, we have a motion. I need a second. Yes. Second. Thank you, Regent Markham. Uh, any other comments, well wishes to Mr. Browder, who has had such a remarkable career with us. My goodness. Yep. And good luck to Melissa. Oh, oh. <laughs> His uh, wife. <laughs> so, Chancellor, would you like to make any comments on David's service? David, uh, from from my very one of the, the very first places that I went when I became chancellor was to the, the TCAT to visit with David, and he is, uh, has always been willing to do whatever uh, whatever he could to, to really help uh, further the, the cause of the TCAT. So he, he will indeed be missed, and wish, it, wish him well recovering from his surgery. Absolutely. Sorry he's not here today, um, but we'll get this resolution to him post-haste. So um, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of approving the resolution for David Browder? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Congratulations, you will be missed. Okay, believe it or not, it is 1131. We have, we have done our work diligently and well this morning, but I think we've had an incredibly meaningful meeting um, over this two days. Our next session will be um, on Thursday, December 10th um, at the TBR System Office in Nashville. Chancellor, any announcements at this juncture? Um, if, if I could, I would like to recognize, uh, for those that are still here, and, uh, the 
Maxine Smith Fellows oh, yeah. have been with us uh, at this meeting to please stand if you are. would. And thank you. <laughs> the, the work they have done, the reports that they have prepared uh, uh, will be extraordinarily useful to us as we look for ways to be more successful with students as we move, as we move forward. I'd also like to thank the folks from Tennessee Tech who have provided our sound and uh, video today. They are, uh, will be with us, we think, for the coming, uh, coming year or so, five years perhaps. Um, it's, it's nice to do business with our own, and, and we very much appreciate it. And I understand that the quality of the, the uh, video stream has been quite high, so, so thank you all very much. And then finally, Carol Tomlinson, um, Sanja Mason, Joan, Jonah Coppola, and of course, Matthew Gann, thank you very much for the work Absolutely. that you did. work for Sanja, I will remind you to complete your survey before we leave today, um, and we could just leave it behind um, at our places. Uh, Dr. Blanding, thank you, thank you. Any final comments or announcements? And as we always say when we visit our campuses, we know you love to see us come, but you're probably equally relieved to see us go. Uh, we know a lot of work goes into this. Thank you. To Nick and to Tricia, welcome as our student and faculty regents respectfully. Um, we are just, we're proud to have you on the team and look forward to working with you over the course of this next year. Uh, once again, it has been an incredibly meaningful morning. Um, this is a great time to be part of higher education in Tennessee. We are proud to know you all. And with that, we stand adjourned. Drive carefully. Thank you.